World News Today. Brought to you by Admiral Corporation in behalf of Admiral distributors and dealers all over America and in many foreign lands. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations and leading news centers of our own country, CBS reporters are waiting to bring you first-hand news from the world's political and battlefronts. Now, here's Douglas Edwards. An Associated Press dispatch from Supreme Allied Headquarters reports today that American troops have reached Namur, 35 miles inside the Belgian border. Other American forces are said to have captured Metz and Nancy in eastern France on the approaches to Germany. To the south, the Germans say they've evacuated Lyon, France's third largest city. Hundreds of American flying forts went deep into Germany today and bombed the Ludwigshafen area. In southeastern Europe, the Russians and Romanians reported attacking heavily in the passes of the Carpathians. On the Italian front, the 8th Army has widened the breach in the Gothic line, and the 5th Army is driving on beyond Pisa. And now, Admiral takes you to London, Ned Calmer reporting. For Britain, this fifth anniversary of the declaration of war has been a day of national prayer. And to a country that's been through what this one has, national prayer is no mere official phrase. From everybody on the British home front today went out a prayer of real gratitude that the war at last seems coming to an early end. And as the center of an empire that has suffered 926,000 casualties in this war, nearly a quarter of a million killed, London is watching its greatest dream come true. News that the Allies are rolling toward Brussels from Tournai. News that the Allies are beyond Nancy on their way to the border of Germany itself. News that the Germans have pulled out of Lyon and may be pulling out of the Gothic line and have abandoned all hope of standing on the Maginot line and perhaps the Siegfried line as well. Just how soon the end will come, the British don't yet know. But a people who've waited for five years can wait a little longer. The qualified observers among them, however, don't believe the Germans can keep on taking it once they've retreated to their own frontiers and the great mass of Allied air power previously directed against targets outside Germany is concentrated on German soil. Hitler and Goebbels may talk every day about fighting to the last, one of these observers says, but no nation can fight when its weapons are knocked out of its hands. The house that Hitler built beyond his frontiers is already tumbling into ruin. Finland and Bulgaria, for all practical purposes, are just about out of the war. Slovakia and Croatia are in full revolt. Hungary is not expected to stay in much longer, with the Russian army standing at her frontier. If the German high command originally planned to hold the line of the Carpathians and the Galati Gap, that plan has had to be scrapped. But as military men in London see it, granting that the Germans can hold their present line down through Poland to Transylvania and from there around to the Brenner Pass and from there around to the Rhine, the enemy will still have some 1,600 miles of defenses to hold against the Allies. And that, in the general British view, is far too much for the remaining German manpower. With her Romanian oil gone, with her Lorraine iron no longer available, and cut off from all her raw material resources, Germany is not expected here to be able to fight on into the winter. Tonight, American, Canadian, and British troops in France and Belgium are making that prediction come true. In all likelihood, their movements in most sectors are far ahead of the actual official report from Allied Supreme Headquarters here in London. And the main reason for that is that Schaefe never makes an official announcement of a town's capture until after the infantry have moved into that town and secured it beyond a question of a doubt of its being retaken. But our armored columns may have passed through the town as much as two days earlier and then driven on or passed the objective toward new objectives farther afield. This accounts for the time lag, which often results in confusion for the listening or reading public, but actually is due to a commendable caution on the part of Schaefe, which sees to it that when you finally get the news officially, it's news that will stick. I return you now to Admiral. We'll have more news in just a moment, but first, here's Warren Sweeney with a message from Admiral Corporation. The new, finer Admiral Automatic Record Changer is the product of years of painstaking research and is a triumph of modern engineering skill. Because the Admiral Changer has always been simple and trouble-free in operation, 
it can be easily understood why Admiral has become the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonographs with automatic record changers. The new Admiral changer will change records far more quickly than was heretofore thought possible. An entirely new electronic tone arm will exert so little pressure and wear on your favorite records that they will last almost indefinitely. There'll be a new depth and beauty of tone, too. Your records will be safe in the new Admiral Changer with little chance of chipping or breaking them. When the war has been won, it will be a thrilling experience for you to load your new Admiral with 10 or 12 records and then just relax and hear them flawlessly played without going near the instrument. Yes, after the war, the radio phonograph with the best of everything will be Admiral. Now, here is Douglas Edwards. Correspondents in the Brest area say a stubborn suicide army of 15,000 German soldiers, sailors, and Marines has turned the siege of the great French port by the Americans into a forgotten battle hundreds of miles behind the front. The price is high in human life for American troops storming Nazi defenses and may be as costly as any piece of territory in France. Major General Hermann Ramke, the fanatic commander of the crack German 2nd Paratroop Division, is directing the defense with a raggle-taggle army, including trapped U-boat crews whose submarines float harmlessly in their pens. German anti-aircraft gunners have been thrown into the line with Marines and infantry sprinkled with Ramke's paratroopers along a wide arc, completely sealing off the port city. And now for a summary of the battle in southern France and Italy, Admiral takes you to CBS Rome, Winston Burdett reporting. German rear guards are fighting now to keep open the last escape routes northward from Lyon. The enemy's garrison troops in the city, along with remnants of the 19th Army, are clearing out with whatever transport they can lay their hands on. Beyond Lyon to the northeast, American forces crossed the Rhone three days ago. Two days ago, they clashed with German armor 20 miles above the city. It's a safe bluff that our spearheads are a good deal further north by now. The fact is that American forces have been operating around Lyon for a week. Last Wednesday, I visited this sector. In the back room of a hotel in a little town which the Mackey had liberated, we found the headquarters of the French Patriot forces that were operating in the hills ahead of us. The Mackey had captured this town a week before. When our troops arrived last Sunday, the French partisan commander was able to give them a complete report on how many Germans there were in Lyon, how many Germans were passing through the city, where the enemy's batteries were, where the German commander had his headquarters. On all the main highways out of Lyon, the French had established roadblocks, very primitive affairs, consisting of overturned tractors and fast carts covered by one or two machine guns. The French partisan commander said he thought the Mackey could seize Lyon, but would never be able to hold it, because the Germans had plenty of tanks. And the partisans' only answer to a tank is a grenade or sometimes a bazooka. Every day, the French commander sent his agents into Lyon to get information about the Germans. As we talked, one of his most valued agents came in. She was a 19-year-old girl. She had just returned from one of her daily missions by bicycle inside the city. At the Mackey headquarters, we talked of German war criminals. The French officers wanted to know what would become of the men who ordered French villages burned to the ground, who ordered French civilians shot, beaten, and tortured to death. The French have not forgotten those crimes. They are afraid that the criminals are safe from punishment now as prisoners of war in American hands. The Mackey has agreed to hand over its prisoners to us, and it has done so regularly. Of course, there have been exceptions. In notorious cases, the partisans have dealt with the Germans themselves, because they do not trust us to do so. They know that the worst criminals, the German officers of highest rank, are the ones who receive the most respectful treatment. Captured generals leave France by plane, and whenever possible, they take their personal staff along with them. The partisan chief of staff said to me, the punishment of war criminals is something that sounds good in the speeches of Roosevelt and Churchill, but it will never be done. The French are bitter about this, it's impossible to expect them to be otherwise, if being a prisoner in Allied hands is the mean of This is Winston Burdett in Rome, returning you now to Admiral in New York. 
And here in our New York studio to discuss with you the situation in southeastern Europe is Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott. On the greater part of the Russian front, there hasn't been much movement for several days. The Germans appear still to be holding open a narrow corridor along the shores of the Gulf of Riga, and they're defending the frontiers of East Prussia successfully, for the time being at least. They're also containing the Soviet bridgeheads on the western bank of the Vistula River. Only northeast of Warsaw do the Russians claim any considerable gains, and there they are retaking ground which was lost to the German counterattacks that took place during August. Of course, all this will change. It won't last because as soon as the Russians get set, overcome their supply difficulties, and regroup their forces, we shall unquestionably see, and probably very soon, a crushing series of Russian offensives along this front. Meanwhile, in Romania... The Russians are pushing rapidly ahead. And it is to this theater that the greatest immediate interest attaches because of the threat thus presented to the whole German fabric of domination in the Balkan Peninsula. The Russians are now engaged in overrunning the wide plains between the Carpathian Mountains and the River Danube, the plains of the ancient principality of Wallachia. They are already deployed along several hundred miles of the Bulgarian frontier, though reports that the frontier has actually been crossed by Russian troops remain unconfirmed. There are also reports, likewise unconfirmed, that Russian and Romanian troops have crossed the mountains into Transylvania, thus threatening the whole central plain of Hungary, and that the Germans are evacuating Yugoslavia and Greece. But while these rumors are flying about, there is a sort of central support for them, because the Russian invasion of the Danubian area does threaten to the north, the Germans in Hungary, to the west, the Germans in Yugoslavia, and the communications of the German forces in Greece, and to the south, what is left of German power in Bulgaria. The Bulgarians are reported anxious to get out of the war. The Yugoslav Patriot armies have been called upon for renewed exertions, and the Hungarian political pot is boiling. Moreover, with the tide of Allied power rolling thunderously into Belgium, And with the Red Armies in the East gathering their strength for a new series of mighty blows, the Germans have need of every German soldier they can muster for a last-ditch stand in the defense of German soil. Hence, it is by no means improbable that they will withdraw their troops from other theaters, as indeed High Allied Authority has already predicted. And one of those theaters may well be the Balkan Peninsula, where there are some 20 to 25 German divisions which certainly could be used elsewhere to better effect. And one of those theaters may well be the Balkan Peninsula, where there are some 20 to 25 German divisions which certainly could be used elsewhere to better effect. It's quite probable that the British will not desire to see the liberation of Greece and Yugoslavia entirely accomplished by the Russians, as relations between London and these two nations have historically and traditionally been very close. Hence, there's the additional possibility that the German departure from the Balkans may be hastened by an Allied effort from the Mediterranean side. What is clear in all this rather confused picture of Balkan turmoil is just as one point. The days of German domination in that trouble-torn peninsula are over. Now here again is Douglas Edwards. And here's a bulletin from Supreme Headquarters. General Eisenhower today sent three messages to the Low Countries, one to the Belgians telling them their hour had struck one to the Germans in Belgium warning against atrocities, and the third to the Dutch telling them not yet to attempt any mass uprising. This summer, the Civil Air Patrol, working in cooperation with the Army Air Forces, has given 9,000 young Americans a taste of pre-flight training. Three of these youngsters are winding up their course, flying in a Liberator bomber somewhere over Long Island with a CBS reporter. Admiral takes you now some 4,000 feet above Long Island, Bill Slocum, Jr., reporting. Bug-eyed young Americans, none of them yet 18, have just succeeded in elbowing Captain Emile de Planck and me into a corner of this B-24's flight deck, so that their view of the miracles occurring just below us is uninterrupted. These miracles, and I suppose the kids are right, they are a little miraculous, are the manipulations of the pilot and co-pilot who are making this four-motored monster purr through the air at about 200 miles per hour, some 4,000 feet up. 
These youngsters have just finished a week of pre-flight training under the Air Force's very wise program, which enables air-minded boys to find out just what it's all about before attempting to become flying cadets. The Civil Air Patrol has voluntarily taken over the ground training end of the job, and the Army has furnished the gear. I will probably get slugged now, but I'm going to take the chance and ask one of the intent young men a question. Bill Davis, have you ever flown before? Yes. Talkative boy, isn't he? Ever been in anything this big? No, sir. Just small CAP planes. Boy, this Liberator is really an airplane. Yes, these four motors will carry a lot of bombs a long way. Aircraft power planes are engines, sir. You never call them motors. Oh, thank you, my boy. Thanks very much. Captain DePlank, a Mitchell Field pilot, is along with us to answer questions. And it might be a good idea if I let him talk to this trio of junior birdmen. Captain? Say, Russ Heath, take a quick look at that instrument panel and tell me our altitude, airspeed, and force. We're just over 4,000 feet, sir. Our indicated speed is 190 miles an hour, and the heading is 240 degrees, although actually we are circling the Mitchell Field. That's right. Captain DePlank, sir, if two engines cut out, could this big plane stay up? Well, that always depends on the load, but with this light load, I'm sure it could. Captain, if the hydraulic system controlling the heavy landing gear went bad, could you crank the wheels down like on lighter planes? Yes, but it's a long, tiresome job. So always check your landing gear before calling the tower for landing instructions. Yes, sir. Our young men are again intent upon the pilot below. So I'd like to ask you a question, Captain. Do these kids like to fly? Do they? They love it. And they'll be good pilots someday. I've flown dozens of them. And I think every boy had read four more books on flying than I had. They asked some very embarrassing questions at times, though. Yes, I noticed that. Say, Lewis Sickle, why did you volunteer for this week of very little flying and a lot of hard work? Because I want to be a pilot. If the war is still on, when my time comes, I want to get into the Air Forces. If it's over then, I want to get into commercial aviation. I figure with this training, I'll have a slight edge over other kids. I wish you could see these youngsters sitting here some 4,000 feet in the sky. I used to see kids look at Babe Ruth the way these boys look at the plank and Colonel Lauren Briggs, our pilot. This next generation is a generation of airmen, and I guess there's nothing for us old gaffers to do but stand on the sidelines and hope for a chance to yell, Hey there, son, why don't you get yourself an automobile? I return you now to Admiral in New York. And now for news of the home front and an interview with a Coast Guardsman who has helped in rescue work in the English Channel, Admiral takes you to CBS Washington. Don Pryor reporting. The latest word on Capitol Hill is that congressional leaders are planning now to adjourn by September 15th. And they might make it because an agreement is in sight on reconversion legislation. Donald Nelson, incidentally, is the current betting favorite here for the job of directing demobilization. But that's not yet definite. That's the news today in Washington. To military men, the most amazing thing about our success in the invasion of Europe is not the swift advance of our armies. It's the fact that almost all of the men and materials for such a drive have been supplied across an open beach. It's taken a constant flow of ships back and forth across the English Channel, almost literally a bridge of ships. And overhead, of course, a bridge of wings in the air. Inevitably, in such an operation, there are lots of accidents. Boats overturn. Planes sometimes fail to get back, and their crews land in the sea. But most of them are rescued, because all that was planned for in advance. To tell you that story, here's Chief Boson's mate, Glenn R. Vleet of Baltimore. Go ahead, Glenn. Start at the beginning. Well, I was with a flotilla of sub-bussers in the Coast Guard. We'd been patrolling for some time down in the Caribbean. Well, that was a very famous flotilla, incidentally. And they had a lot to do with cutting down Hitler's U-boat fleet. But that's another story. What happened then? All of a sudden, they loaded all of our boats onto ships and took us over to England. And since the invasion, we've been doing rescue work in the Channel. Incidentally, how big is a sub-buster? 83 feet. It's just a little boat with one officer and 13 men. But it can do a lot of work. Well, apparently so. Just what did you do? Well, as you said, our principal job was rescue. But we did convoy work, too, and lots of other odd jobs. How many men did your flotilla rescue? Oh, I don't know. About 1,100 up to the time I left. Mostly soldiers? Yes, most of them young guys. They must have been pretty glad to see you, weren't they? 
They never said much. They were glad to get out of the water, of course. But they were pretty mad about getting dunked before they had a chance at the beachhead. beachhead. And they were all anxious to get back in. Were many of them badly wounded? Only a few. We sent those back to England. The rest of them went right on into Normandy. Incidentally, did you ever get to the beachhead? With crutches. Oh, yes, I forgot to mention that. Glenn just got out of the hospital. In fact, if he hadn't been wounded, we wouldn't even have him here today. He'd be over there still pulling men out of the ocean. Tell us what happened, Glenn. I don't know what happened. I'm the guard who doesn't know what hit him. But you do know what it did to you. How did it happen? Well, the British landing craft had been knocked around a bit and abandoned by the crew. We were supposed to pick it up and tow it into the beach. There was a bad storm at the time. We came alongside, and I put a man aboard to make a line fast to the sand post. When all of a sudden, something hit me in the knee. You don't know what? No, probably shrapnel, I guess. There was some firing in along the shore, whatever it was. It spun me around like a top and knocked me down. And then what? That was that. The gunner's, gave, the gunner's mate gave me first aid, and I lay in my bunk for the next two days while we rode out the storm. My knee was laid wide open. Then they transferred me to an LCI where a young Navy doctor stretched me out in the mess table and sewed me up. And there I moved to an LST, then to an evacuation station on the beachhead, and finally back to England on another LST. And eventually back home. Would you like to go back, Glenn? Gosh, yes. I had a letter the other day from one of my buddies written from Cherbourg. From what he says, I'd like to go ashore in France, standing up. Well, you made it possible for a lot of other guys to do that, and I hope you can. I return you now to Admiral in New York. In the Pacific, American liberators have loosed another 110 bomb raid on Davao in the southern Philippines, and they destroyed 38 Japanese planes in the process. It was the heaviest American raid so far on any Philippine target. So suddenly did the Americans strike that the Japanese were able to mount only nine fighter interceptors. One of these was shot down. The other 37 planes were caught on the ground. Two American planes were lost to Japanese ACAC. Installations and the excellent airfield at Davao were the principal targets of the bombers. General MacArthur, in announcing the Davao strike, revealed that an even heavier raid, a 137-ton attack, was staged at the same time on Palau Island, which lies along the sea route his forces may use when they invade the Philippines. Previously, the Tokyo Radio had announced the Davao raid. It claimed that there were 40 liberators over the important port city, which was populated largely by Japanese before the war. The Japanese radio also said that a Pacific Fleet task force shelled the Bonins. The enemy said they were bombed heavily on Thursday and Friday. There's been no Allied confirmation of these reports. In Burma, Allied forces driving the Japanese southward now control more than 20,000 square miles, nearly a tenth of the country's total area. They've all but completed potentially useful lines of communication cutting across great barriers of the terrain from India to the China frontier. Americans, British, Imperials, and Chinese have an east-to-west line now looking southward down all the Burma valleys which form the neutral lines of communication. They've gone a long way toward solution of what Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, the Supreme Commander in Asia, recently called a logistical nightmare. And now, once again, here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral. Have you ever prepared a fresh vegetable plate? And I mean fresh. With vegetables picked months ago and frozen hard as billiard balls. Or eaten meat months old, but as fresh and even more tender than the day it was bought. These things will be common to your daily life when you can own a new peacetime Admiral two-temperature refrigerator. The Admiral built-in home freezer will make possible many practical and economical ideas for more gracious living than you have ever dreamed of. There will be many other exclusive Admiral features, too. Purified moist cold will prevent foods from wilting or drying without the use of covered dishes. Sterile lamp will utilize ultraviolet rays to kill bacteria, retard the growth of mold, and to eliminate offensive icebox odors. And last, but certainly not least... The space stealing coils will be gone, doing away with a regular, messy job of defrosting. Yes, the ready acceptance that America has given Admiral Radio, America's smart set, will be duplicated for the Admiral two temperature electric refrigerator. Military and essential business travel is now at a new all time high. Troop movements, furlough and casualty travel, and war production activity must still have first call on our nation's transportation systems. So please don't travel unless it is absolutely necessary. Pleasure travel must wait for victory. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set, 
and post-war makers of Admiral Refrigerators, Admiral Home Freezers, Admiral Electric Ranges. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings you world news today by shortwave, direct from leading news centers of the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. WBBM Chicago. Good books provide much consolation for wounded servicemen confined to hospitals and rest camps overseas. Help them by sharing with them some of the books you've enjoyed reading. Send books to the British War Relief Society, 30 North Michigan, Chicago 2, Illinois. You are listening to the WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago.